Welcome to the Probate Nation. We are in the midst of a series of shows about the durable financial power of attorney. As we have discussed, the power of attorney is a great disability planning tool and recommended by estate planners to avoid the cost of a court-supervised conservatorship. But that lack of court oversight sometimes results in intentional and unintentional misuses of the power of attorney and, these, and disputes arising within the family over these alleged misuses. A recent show reviewed the various forms available to resolve the dispute, and often an important component in resolving the dispute is getting accurate information from an independent source as to exactly how the power of attorney was used by the agent. The person typically hired to provide this information is a forensic CPA or accountant. They dissect all the transactions, look behind the invoices being paid and the payees of disbursements to confirm what is and is not for the benefit of the elderly one, one, loved one everyone is seeking to protect. We are pleased to have as our guest tonight a CPA experienced with forensic accounting. He will guide us through the forensic accounting process that often unfolds in these types of disputes. He's a partner uh, in CST Group CPAs PC in Reston, Virginia. His practice includes audits, strategic tax planning, internal risk assessment for closely held businesses and other typical CPA work in a wide range of industries. In addition, he earned the designation of Certified Fraud Examiner from the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. Over the last decade, he has been voted a top wealth advisor, a super CPA, and a top financial professional. Please welcome CPA John Purcell. John. I didn't realize it was in the presence of someone with so, much, uh, ac so many accolades. My goodness gracious, well, you were topping everything. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank well, you. thanks for coming and talking with us. Mm -hmm. You know, forensic accounting, you know, it sounds kind of mysterious, but, you know, what exactly is forensic accounting? Well, forensic accounting is the use of professional accounting skills to investigate fraud or embezzlement in matters involving potential or actual civil or criminal lit, uh, litigation. Uh, the purpose is to determine damages. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, so what are some of the typical projects undertaken by forensic accountants? Well, uh, forensic accountants can do a number of different things. Um, most common is investigation of fraudulent transactions, but forensic accountants may also be involved in investigations regarding um, misstatement of financial statements. Mm -hmm. They can also be involved in investigations with in bankruptcy matters, divorce matters, and computer forensics. So the spectrum is, is quite broad when you think of forensic accounting and okay. what they do. Okay. Now, so our, our program that we've been focusing on over the last few shows is, mm -hmm. has to do with the use of a financial power of attorney that many people use and family members use to take care of mom and dad's assets as they get older. And uh, we're trying to begin to focus on those types of problems. So I guess the, one of the first thing is we talk about when you, be, you get engaged to under, undertake a project mm -hmm. uh, where we're looking to see how money's been used by somebody. Um, what are the important facts that you need to know in undertaking such an under, a project? Well, the first thing the forensic accountant would need to understand is what is the problem? What is the investigation about? Um, and what we do to accomplish this is we usually interview, interview excuse me, key individuals who are not uh, targets of the case itself. Um, in the case of a financial power of attorney, um, what the forensic accountant would be looking for is basically we'd like to attain a copy of the power of attorney document. Mm -hmm. um, we'd like to know what assets the principal owned, and then um, what internal controls and authority is in place over uh, the power of attorney relationship. In other words, what, what are the expectations? Okay, so when you say um, the controls, you're looking to see if there's some sort of ongoing reporting requirement that's been going on, or they've been delivering reports or monthly bank statements or whatever the case exactly, is. Cause okay. Exactly, because exactly. When you look at the power of attorney relationship, there's usually the principal, the agent, and of course, um, there could be interested, interested parties like family members mm -hmm. who um, may want to know what's going on. Of and, course. Mm -hmm. Of so. course. We talk about transparency. That's very, very important. Well, let's, I know we, when we talked about the, in, during the course of our pre-interview to, to prepare for the show, we talked mm -hmm. about the components of a transaction, which of course mm -hmm. is, is CPA speak for how we break things down, but, mm -hmm. um, but as lawyers, we are very interested in that. So, 
When you talk about that, what do you mean component of a transaction? What are you looking for as you begin to undertake to examine a power of attorney abuse or misuse, as the case may be? Well, the uh, transactions, uh, generally what you like to have is good internal controls. And in order to achieve good internal controls, what you like to have is separation of certain duties or responsibilities in a transaction. And primarily what you're looking for is separation from the authorization process separation from custody and separation from the actual recording of transactions in the accounting records. Okay. So, okay. Um, so talk about some good systems of controls that you like to see. Well, generally, a good system of in internal controls will separate those functions. In other words, uh, the individual who uh, is, has custody of assets, you wouldn't necessarily want that individual to also have a th um, uh, record keeping responsibilities. The thought would be that that individual could write checks to themselves, a friend, et cetera, and then mass those same transactions in the accounting records. So that's the authorization. Who's authorized mm -hmm. to actually disperse the asset? Correct. And usually the, the authorization is sort of that beginning of the process. It is the person that says, that, that initiates the order, mm -hmm. for example. And in, in, in this situation, the, uh, the authorization may be, I approve that this bill should be paid, whether it's for you know, medical purposes, food, et cetera. Um, the, the custody function um, is, is that person that executes the order, so to speak. So they have the checkbook, and they're they the ones the that checkbook. can actually write the checkbook. So Correct. typically in, the, in a financial power of attorney situation, the agent is got both of those functions typically. Pretty much they do, exactly, which brings in the third component, which is really that most important component, and that's the recording or the accounting function. And, and that's where if you're um, a, a durable power of attorney, you're, you're going to want to have some recording mechanism to report to those interested parties like we mentioned earlier. So that is really the, the, the one place where an agent under a financial power of attorney can shine yes. and really protect themselves from claims down the road by providing that sort of transparency by way of reporting on a regular basis to those interested parties, which might very well be their siblings or their uncles or their aunts or whatever the case may be. Absolutely. That is spot on. That's, that's the importance of recording. And I can't add enough emphasis to that. that that sort of creates the transparency to family members, et cetera. Nothing like a good shining light to really make people you know, feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a look at some specific types of assets where most of the activity typically takes place with the financial power of attorney, and that's mm -hmm. bank accounts. Yes. So bank accounts and bank statements. So what type of documentation do you like to see when you're starting to go through the bank accounts? What, uh, what we definitely would like to receive is a copy of the bank statements over a period of time, especially if a problem is described, you, you want to cover the period of time of which supposedly a, a fraud or misrepresentation has taken place. So the bank statements is clearly the document. Um, what we also look for is how many bank accounts are we dealing with? In other words, is there one? Investment accounts also, which sort of falls into that cash category, but um, we're definitely interested in, in the documents that are behind the bank statements too, cancel checks, deposit tickets, et cetera. Okay, so we do want to get into the checks and see what those, what those say. So mm -hmm. do you get to the actual invoices that are being paid as well? Absolutely. In fact, the invoice supports the transaction. And when we were discussing earlier authorization, Usually that's, that's the mechanism or the piece of evidence that either identifies the transaction as, as a valid transaction or if there is no invoice receipt, et cetera, it raises the bar of, well, this transaction can't be legitima legitimatized because there's no supporting documentation like an invoice. So if, if you're an agent in a, in a power of attorney relationship, I would highly recommend that you hold on to all supporting documentation, to all disbursements. It just alle alleviates any potential problem down the road. Now, when, when, when the agent you know, <laughs> brings in a stack of bank statements, mm -hmm. 
Do you like to get those from the agent or do you prefer to see those coming directly from the financial institution? It's a great question and it depends. And it depends <laughs> if, if the agent is the target. If the agent is clearly the target of the investigation, then that's probably not the individual we would like to get those, base, those bank statements from. More often than not, we would like to uh, have an authorized party submit a request to the bank to send us the, the, the documents directly. It just avoids any kind of risk of tampering. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. um, so when, as you look at those bank statements, you know, <coughs> what are you looking for? What, what sort of piques your interest that really starts to make your, your, your juices start to flow, you know, as you think you might have found something? Well, it's, it's, you're looking for the transactions that don't fit in. In other words, um, when you're uh, um, looking at bank statements of an individual, there's repetition. There, the, you know, theoretically, there's food costs, there's electrical bills, et cetera. You're looking for the transaction that doesn't fit in. That, that you may test a few of those items that are falling into the norm, especially if they're not any kind of an exception, but you're looking for the what's the $6,000 disbursement that we, we've not seen in prior bank statements. So you're, so you're looking for patterns. You're also um, looking for wire transfers if those are, are present on the bank statements. Clearly, that's not a normal event. We, we generally don't wire money um, unless it's to one of our an investment account, et cetera. So. How about, um, so one of the things that we see a lot of times is, of course, payments to pay a credit card. Mm -hmm. So do you want to, do you dig deeper and take a look it's at that credit question. card credit card statement? See Absolutely. what's going on there? Absolutely, Richard, because the credit card statement is a is a key or the, the payments to the credit card um, account is is a key to a whole nother window of disbursements that may not be self evident because the um, the credit card statement itself will once again have a list of transactions that have taken place during a period of time. So Okay. Mm -hmm. So those are uh, we, we really cover those. Those are very, very important. Um, um, so let's talk about brokerage accounts mm -hmm. and those statements, okay? So what type of documentation now are you looking for as you begin to examine a brokerage account? Well, brokerage accounts are, are interesting. Obviously, they, they, they're the investments. Um, they're the um, more, I like to say, long-term assets of the principal. And mm -hmm. so what we're looking for here is, once again, any kind of wire activity, you know, especially if cash is leaving the investment account, is it going into the principal's primary cash account, or where is it going? Um, we also like to look at the trade activity. You know, if trades are quite frequent, is, is, you know, who is the individual that's uh, managing, if it's a managed investment account versus a non-managed, you know, what are they doing? Is, is the strategy seem apparent or self, uh, self-described because, you know, if the assets are made to be for an elderly individual, you'd probably want more secured assets than risky assets. But mm -hmm. if there's a constant churning of the account, that might be an abuse that's going on there. Um, okay. You'd obviously want to look at, uh, uh, at um, you know, the dates within the statements if there are any other transactions, like like just like with the bank statements, anything that looks out of place, okay, you know, fees, uh, checks written from the investment account. Sure. So, and again, like the bank statements, do you like to get the brokerage statements directly from the brokerage house as opposed to from the agent that's being investigated? Absolutely, absolutely, if okay. at all possible, just to avoid tampering of documentation. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So. Um, Let's get let's get into some of that. I really don't want to give somebody a, a roadmap to how to do this, but mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about ways an agent can abuse a power of attorney. Okay, so so um, you know as we consider these things, you know, uh, uh, let's tell me a little bit about the the fraud tree. Okay. Okay, a little bit of the, which which comes from your experience as a certified fraud examiner. Sure. Well, the fraud tree is uh, um, the way the Association of Certified uh, Fraud Examiners, what they did is they defined fraud into many different categories. The, the idea is um, we, hear, we hear terms like embezzlement, um, theft, skimming, larceny, but the, the, AI, the um, Association of Certified Fraud Examiners 
um, identifies fraud in a more uh, a tree or specific categories. And, and at the top category, you have corruption. You also have asset misappropriation and financial statement fraud. The, the type of fraud you're more likely to encounter in a power of attorney situation is misappropriation of assets. Okay, well, let's yeah. talk about how some of that could occur. So some of the, the schemes that you see. So mm -hmm. let's talk about false vendors. Okay. What, is, what does that mean? Well, false vendors is a type of um, mi asset misappropriation scheme used by the, f the perpetrator. The idea is what they do is they create a, a, a fake vendor. Um, you know, ABC company. Mm -hmm. um, here, the dishonest in individual also creates a, a fake shell company. And, uh, you know, so they pretend that they are the president of ABC company. Um, they submit invoices to, with, with the fabricated name, the idea is they want that this invoice to be paid. Mm -hmm. And so the agent could submit the invoice or uh, take the invoice pay on it with the expectation that once the check is cut and signed they'll take the fraudster or the agent would take that funds and deposit it in their their bank account under the ABC company okay so let's talk about cash receipts fraud okay cash receipts fraud can come into primarily two different categories there's cash larceny which is theft of cash that's already been recorded on the books so in this case, this, these would be transactions that are already in the bank account that, that have already existed. And then there's skimming, which is the interception of cash before it actually enters the record keeping. So, i.e., if your principal owned rental property and they were collecting rent in the form of cash or the, the, the agent possibly could take off $200 off the top and say, nope, the rent, it's $800 a month and that's what I negotiated. And, and it would be much more difficult to detect that truly the, the tenant was paying $1,000. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. How about check, check tampering? Well, check tampering is a scheme that involves uh, um, several different things you could do in check tampering. Um, you could have a forge maker scheme and in this case what happens is the creator signs the check to a selected payee that is not really an authorized source. Um, you could have a forged endorsement i.e. maybe it's not the agent but maybe I know where the checks are to the you know to mm -hmm. the principal. I know what the signature looks like of the agent. I create a bill and I, I create a check rather and I, in, I in, I, you know, create a false signature on the check and mm -hmm. it goes through to the bank. Okay. Um, there's also altered payee, meaning the check is originally drafted in the name of, say, like ABC Company, and as a fraudster, I might come in and change the name after it, it's posted to the accounting records to, um, you know, XYZ Company, uh -huh. and then I will cash the check at a controlled bank account under XYZ Company. So. Okay. And then there's authorized maker which in this case, the, the individual or the agent is the proper authorized signature on the account, but they're just writing a check to a bogus company or to a friend under perpetrated services rendered, for example. Okay, mm -hmm. a, lot of, uh, a lot of parties playing games here. Yes, like. so, a lot of. So, mm -hmm. so you end up with all this work that you do, investigation, and you produce a, what's called, a, what we refer to as the forensic accounting report. Mm -hmm. um, what type of report is that? What, is, what typically do you, with that, what does that report say? Well, the report will include a number of things on it, depending on, as we just discussed earlier, what is the purpose of the report itself. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, in a forensic investigation of which, um, let's, let's suppose fraud was discovered and we knew it, you know, it was identified, the report is going to, number one, identify the amount of the loss that was discovered by our investigation. It would also provide a detailed summary of the description of the, um, of the losses. And then it would provide the, the evidence that was used to detect the loss, whether mm -hmm. it was canceled checks, invoices, fake contracts, et cetera. So some of these reports can be quite lengthy because the report itself may actually include all the evidence 
that was discovered during the investigation. Um, one thing I do want to stress is that the report will not state the guilt or innocent of the individual or the party investigated. We leave that up to the courts to determine that. So. Okay. All right, well, let's, let's talk about, you know, planning. You know, he, people receive this, have a power of attorney that they're using to take care of mom or dad's money. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they're trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, reasonable people can disagree about what's right, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and especially in the family context, there can be a lot of things that can get away of that, in the way of that. So how about some, uh, from your experience, do you have any suggestions about what should be done by the agent mm -hmm. in order to plan for these types of potential challenges down the road? So well, it's, it's a great question, and what I would recommend is, is, is save every piece of paper, document, invoice, receipts, et cetera, because as an agent, you're going to be dispersing principal resources or the resources of the principal, so you want to make sure uh, that your transactions are well documented. Um, you know, clearly, if somebody's going to call something into question, how are you, think about how you're going to defend yourself. Well, you know, here's the invoice, and I did pay for the pool cleaning service bill this month, or for, or you know, these are these are the costs that uh, we paid in medical bills this month, and here are the invoices from Blue Cross or whoever it might be. Or, so clearly, documentation. I think the other piece of this is also the reporting element. You know, um, an interested party might want to know where's the money going? What are we spending it on? If we have to take $1,000 out of the investment account every month to help cover cost, what are those costs? Mm -hmm. um, another very important device or uh, item that could be used is budgeting. And you know, budgeting is, is critical because it sort of sets the expectation. You know, if I'm the agent and you're a family member, um, I might, I might want to be able to communicate to you that, hey, every month we're going to dive into the principal's resources, you know, two, three thousand dollars a month to cover living costs. So mm -hmm. a budget will help create that transparency. So in a budget, especially in the family context, the budget that everybody, you know, agrees is, is a good baseline to start with. Absolutely. Begins to kind of set expectations about how things are going to be spent and, and where money is going to go. Yep. Uh, unusual transactions, you know, how do people, how should people deal with those in order to document those and protect themselves? Well, clearly, um, alerting interested parties is, is, is one way to do it. I'm not saying that the agent should neglect its duties and say, hey, should I pay this or not? But I think alerting interested parties is, hey, you know, we have this unusual transaction, we have to deal with this. Um, I, I think that's one way. As, as described before, the documentation, you definitely want to hold on to the documentation in all cases. It's really your only alibi. As you pointed out earlier, when you have the authorization and custody responsibilities, it's, that's sort of the last piece of document that could save you if somebody should question an unusual disbursement. Okay, good idea. Well, you know, John, there's just a lot here, and, and I know we, we couldn't get to everything because there was just so much to cover, and we are unfortunately constrained by time. Mm -hmm. um, how about any finding wor final words of advice or warnings you'd like to share with our viewers who are, you know, serving as an agent under a power of attorney, or maybe mom and dad's getting ready to name them, and they're, they're thinking, well, what do I have to do? And uh, well, I, uh, just real quick, it would be the budget, definitely establish a budget, establish an understanding of what are the monthly, annually, quarterly reporting requirements. I think all that will, will certainly protect you as an agent. Remember, you're probably the one, the agent, that's going to most likely come under suspicion when fraud takes place because you have all the authority or power. So, so as transparent as you can be through through uh, you know reporting back to interested family members, you know unless the principal absolutely forbids it, of course, in the document because maybe they want to keep things private. But certainly, as much as you can, um, be transparent and, and use a budget um, and save documentation. So those would be those are all good suggestions, John. I want to thank you so very much for taking the time, coming and visit with us today and share all this great information. You know. We see more and more people nowadays with financial powers of attorney, and people are being challenged by their siblings. So uh, this is a great public service, and I want to thank you for taking the time to share your, your knowledge. 
Well, thank you, Richard. It's been a pleasure. You know, one of the most important matters to sort out in a family dispute over the use of a power of attorney is just how that power was used and for whose benefit. Often a forensic accountant is the one called in to provide that independent report. And what we learned in the course of the show tonight is the level of investigation done to produce that report. Experienced forensic accountants are well aware of the many schemes people use to disguise or hide their inappropriate actions and in the course of an investigation, these misuses will be uncovered. We also learned some proactive steps you can take to document your actions with the power of attorney and the benefit of continuously reporting your actions to all interested parties. Full disclosure and transparency over your use of the power for a loved one is a powerful tool to deter family disputes from ever arising. But we encourage anyone named as an agent in a power of attorney to seek advice on their intended use or prior use of that power from an attorney with experience in these matters. This advice, based on the facts and circumstances of your situation, may well prevent a dispute from arising. In an upcoming show, we will hear from medical professionals who are often called upon to opine whether mom ever even had the capacity to execute the power now in dispute, or might have been unduly influenced execute that power. Should be a good show. This brings us to the conclusion of our show this evening. Hope you found it informative. And remember that replays of the show can be viewed on the Probate Nation website. On behalf of the Probate Nation, thank you for visiting with us.